we are required to match the lettered statements with the numbered nerves and each lettered statement can be used with more than one nerve and more than one nerve can be suitable for any of these statements. So let's first identify the nerves. Nerve one is a branch or a one of the groups of branches of the facial nerve. To be specific, it's the temporal branch of the facial nerve. So this nerve is in fact its motor to the muscles of facial expression. So A is correct. It's not sensory and it's a branch of a cranial nerve. It's not a branch of a spinal nerve. Regarding the nerve two, this is the greater occipital nerve and this is a branch from the posterior primary ramus of C2. It is sensory, supplies the skin of the back of the scalp and so B is correct for two and it's a branch of a spinal nerve, the greater occipital nerve. Regarding nerve number three, it ascends upwards and forwards on the sternocleidomastoid muscle and reaches the skin and fascia over the parotid gland and the angle of the mandible. This is the greater auricular nerve and it's again, it's sensory. It's a branch of the cervical plexus, anterior primary ramus of C2 and 3 that is formed by anterior primary rami of the upper four cervical nerves. So it is sensory. The great auricular is sensory and it is a branch of a spinal nerve. One point to be clarified here is that the cervical plexus has other cutaneous branches. One of them goes upwards and backwards and supplies the scalp behind the auricle. This is the lesser occipital nerve and the lesser occipital nerve, unlike the greater occipital nerve in two, the lesser occipital is a branch of the cervical plexus, its anterior primary ramus of C2, while the greater occipital nerve is a posterior primary ramus of C2. Which muscle opens the jaw in yawning? The jaw can be depressed passively by gravity, and there are some muscles like the suprahyoid muscles that can also depress the jaw, but the most important muscle that works in active opening of the mouth as in yawning is the lateral pterygoid muscle. The muscle that is attached to the neck of the mandible, to the capsule of the temporomandibular joint and the intraarticular disc, it pulls on the neck of the mandible forwards and move it forward so that it glides over the articular eminence and results in opening of the mouth. Identify the dural folds one to three. This is a mid-sagittal section of the head showing here the posterior cranial fossa and this is the falx cerebelli that is located between the cerebellar lobes and the valicula and then this is the fold that forms a tent for the cerebellum and a roof for the posterior cranial fossa. It's the tentorium cerebelli. And here you can see part of another falx which extends between the two cerebral hemispheres. And that is the falx cerebri, which is located in the longitudinal cerebral fissure. At the junction of the falx and the tentorium cerebelli, you can see here, this is the straight sinus. What is the name of the foramen indicated by the pointer? This is a superior view of the calvaria of the skull. And you can see here, this is the lambdoid suture posteriorly. And this is the sagittal suture, which is located between the two parietal bones. So this opening, in fact, is located within the parietal bone and it's called parietal emissary foramen. Like any other emissary foramen, it transmits emissary veins that communicate between the veins outside the skull and the dural venous sinuses. These veins are variable and so as these foramina. So that's why you can see the foramen on one side. You don't see it on the other. And in many skulls, the parietal emissary foramen is even absent. Such emissary veins communicate between the veins inside and outside the skull might provide a dangerous route of spread of infection from outside the skull to the dural venous sinuses.
identify the vessels A and B. This is a dissection of the lower part of the face, and these two vessels are crossing the lower border of the body of the mandible, extending upwards and medially toward the medial canthus of the eye on the lateral side of the nose. The vessel that is located more anterior is a little bit tortuous, and this is the facial artery. At this location, opposite the inferior border of the mandible and anterior to where masseter is attached, although masseter has been removed here, this is masseter, it has been folded to the side, but just in the front of masseter, you can feel the pulsations of the facial artery by compressing it against the inferior border of the mandible. Posterior to the artery is the vein the facial vein. So here's the facial vein. It has a straighter course and continues upwards as the angular vein, which communicates with the ophthalmic veins. The facial artery is a branch of the external carotid artery and the facial vein continues downwards and it drains into the internal jugular vein. Before doing so, it unites with the anterior branch of the retromandibular vein and form the common facial vein, and the common facial vein enters the internal jugular vein. Identify the bones A, B, and C. This is a view of the lateral side of the nose and medial side of the orbit. The bone on the medial side of the orbit, A, is the body of the ethmoid bone, and you can see that it's a very thin bone here. It's easily broken because it contains ethmoid air cells. That's why it's not recommended to hold the skull from the orbits. The dry skull should be held from the foramen magnum in, a, in order to avoid cracking the thin shell of bone that is located on the medial side of the orbit that is the body of the sphenoid. B is the lacrimal bone, and you can see here's the fossa for the lacrimal sac. More anteriorly here, this is the frontal process of the maxilla. You can follow it upwards and articulates with the frontal bone. It's not the nasal bone. The nasal bones are located more anteriorly and superiorly. Identify the muscle A, which part of the brachial plexus is located anterior to it. This is... Uh, a view of the posterior triangle of the neck and you can see the posterior triangle is bounded anteriorly by sternocleidomastoid muscle inferiorly is the the base is the clavicle and posteriorly it is the trapezius muscle the posterior triangle is in fact located on the lateral side of the neck but it's called posterior because it is located posterior to sternocleidomastoid muscle in the floor of the posterior triangle there are several muscles but here we can distinguish two of them here. The most anterior is the scalinus anterior, and this one, A, is the scalinus medius. To make sure of that, you can look at the brachial plexus here. The brachial plexus is sandwiched in between them. In fact, it's the roots of the brachial plexus that are located anterior to scalinus medius and posterior to scalinus anterior. And what we can see here, these are the trunks of the brachial plexus that extend laterally and continue downward behind the clavicle to reach the axilla. So the part of the brachial plexus that is located anterior to scalinus medius are the roots of the brachial plexus. Identify the lines A and B. What do they mark? These are the temporal lines. A is the superior temporal line and B is the inferior temporal line. The inferior temporal line bounds the temporal fossa. This is where temporalis muscle arises. And you can see that both lines here, they arise from a single crest, and then they separate into superior and inferior temporal lines. If we follow the inferior temporal line, which binds the temporal fossa and temporalis muscle, it continues backwards and downwards with the superior border of the zygomatic arch. The superior temporal line is where the temporalis fascia is attached. This is a thick fascia that covers the surface of temporalis muscle, and so it is located superficial to temporalis and extends more peripherally to this superior temporal line. If we follow the superior temporal line here, we will find that it continues backwards and then downwards to the mastoid process. So B marks the attachment, the inferior temporal line marks the attachment of temporalis 
and A marks the attachment of temporalis fascia. Name the structure A. This is a view of the submental and submandibular region of the neck. Here's the hyoid bone. This is the mandible and mylohyoid muscle. From one side, the other mylohyoid joining together, they form a midline raphi. And superficial to mylohyoid here is the anterior belly of digastric muscle. Anterior belly of digastric muscle is supplied by the nerve to mylohyoid, which also supplies mylohyoid muscle, as its name indicates. This nerve is a branch of the inferior alveolar nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So the cranial nerve is cranial nerve 5, mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, V3.